Well, we're picking up in our series. We've been going through the last couple of weeks. You're kind of winding on down. Uh, we're doing a series we're calling Running with the Horses. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Just a little bit of backdrop. Right? We've been looking at this dialogue um, that's taking place between God and the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, at this time, uh, Jeremiah is frustrated. Um, he is discouraged as he uh, sees the decadence that's taking place in the world around him. He's even more frustrated at what he's seeing amongst God's people. He's frustrated with the world. He's frustrated with God's people. And as we saw, as we've been looking at this text, we also see that, that Jeremiah is frustrated with God because God is not responding the way Jeremiah thinks God should respond. God is not on the same time schedule as Jeremiah. He is not as creative, perhaps, in his thinking as to what should be done with these people as Jeremiah is. And Jeremiah, we saw in chapter 12 in the book of Jeremiah, um, asks these questions. Perhaps you have asked these same questions yourself as you look at the world in which we live. Jeremiah says things like, how long will these people prosper? These people who are not following you, how long will they prosper? How long will, will these people thrive? Seems like they're doing just fine, as far as I can tell. Lord, how long will you allow this to continue? How long, O oh Lord, before you act on behalf of your own good name? Here's, God, what I think you should do. Kill them. That was the advice from Jeremiah to God. We read about that in Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse three. Jeremiah, after asking these questions, says, pull them all out like sheep for the slaughter. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. You don't come out of a slaughter living. We've all been there, or maybe near there, as we look around and just wished that God would just remove some people, would remove some groups, perhaps even remove some parties. But that's the wrong response, church. A response like that only reveals our lack of having a godly mindset and our need to adjust our perspective by examining our own hearts. Because God in his holiness, if God has chosen not to act, if God has not responded the way that we think he should respond and hasn't removed the people that we think he should remove, maybe, just maybe, in the wisdom of God, he has a plan. Maybe God's timing, if not in alignment with ours, is better than ours. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, God, if I was running things, if I could just, you know, put in motion the things that, that I think you should do, here's what it would look like. As if God's like thinking, oh, you know, I hadn't thought of that, right? Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me, Lord, to see through the lens of your sovereignty so that I might respond appropriately. We need to help hold in proper tension our awareness that, I mean, I want to see some things change, don't you? I mean, I, you know, hey, I, I'm not happy with what I see. But if you're losing sleep over that, and if you're dividing with people over that, 
And that seems to consume your thinking. I'm thinking we need to take a moment of pause and remember that God of all things, if he's allowing things to move at the pace in which he's allowing them to move, then we might need to just slow down a little bit and get in alignment with God's pace. Jeremiah's solution, God just killed them. Put them out to slaughter. Listen to God's response, Jeremiah. If you've raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with the horses? And if in a safe place you are so trusting What will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? What will you do when the heat gets turned up? What will you do when I pull you out of a safe environment and I bring you into a a land that perhaps isn't so safe? If they are wearying you, what are you going to do when the pressure really gets turned up? Jeremiah, you're exhausted because you're running the wrong race. Jeremiah, you're tired because you're looking in the wrong direction. Jeremiah, you are frustrated because you're focusing on the wrong issues. Jeremiah, run with the horses. Not with man. Not with man. That's what we've been looking at these last couple of weeks. And you see this idea, this, the, 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 the possibility of, of being able to run with horses is only possible if we are empowered by God the Holy Spirit. You and I are not designed to be able to keep up with horses. But you are able to keep up when empowered by the Holy Spirit. God calling a people to do something that we become fully dependent upon God to accomplish in us and through us. Last week we talked about the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. An ongoing, deliberate, intentional, and consistent emptying of those things within us that are contrary to our new nature and releasing the fullness of the Spirit to flow out in our lives. Emptying those things, nothing will hinder our ability to walk in the Spirit than when we are full of ourselves. Those things that are consistent with our old nature, the way in which we respond, the way in which we navigate through the challenges of life, the way in which we get to where we want to go. We have learned a certain way of getting by in life, but now as we come into Christ, we recognize not everything, but a good amount of those things, they need to change. Because a lot of the ways in which I lived my life in the past was about putting myself forward about getting my needs, my desires, my wants, my goals accomplished. But now, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, my agenda is not myself, but my agenda must be Christ and Christ alone. And in order for that to happen, I've got to empty myself of those things that self-promote Being full of the Spirit doesn't mean we get more of the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit gets more of us. It's recognizing that to the degree that we decrease, as John the Baptist said, the more he increases. Being full of the Spirit doesn't mean we get more of the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit gets more of us. Paul likens it to a walk, the faith walk of the believer. For today's purposes, I want to call it the walk that runs, runs with the horses. The faith walk of the believer, putting in motion that which God the Holy Spirit is doing in us and through us. 
A life that is dependent upon the infilling and informing and influencing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the only way that possibly could happen is we must deplete ourselves of ourselves so that God, the Holy Spirit, might have rule and reign in our lives. The walk that runs. We were looking at Paul's words to the church at Ephesus in chapter four. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna pick up at verse 17. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. I love what Paul is saying here. He's giving us a really clear example. He's saying, listen, at one time, you used to walk one way. But you must no longer walk that way. What do we call that? So it's with an R, help me here. It's repentance. Right, what is repentance? Repentance is we are walking one way and we stop, we're confronted with our sin, we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we do it about face and now we are walking in a different direction. He said this, I testify in the Lord, he's saying this to you and I, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. I won't ask if any names come to your faith, to your mind, your remembrance when you think of people who walk according to the futility of their minds. I think we probably could all identify with that ourselves. It's this idea of, of living lives that just makes sense to us. And Paul is saying that's not the way you are to walk. No longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have, be- have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to- and greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's what we were. I celebrated 32 years of giving my life fully over to Jesus, November 11th, 1989. God stepped into my world and turned it upside down. At that time, I was walking in darkness. I was walking in the futility of my mind. I was at the center of my universe. And when I got to a point where I realized that this life could never satisfy that which God had placed in my heart, I fully surrendered to his lordship, repented of my sins, And on November 11th, 1989, gave my heart fully to God and hadn't looked back once and God has given me and brought me further than I ever thought possible. November 11th, 1989, Jesus stepped in. What Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus is that's not the way you are to walk anymore. He says in verse 20, That is not the way you learned Christ. I like that. It's like our father coming in and saying, listen, this is not how this family operates. This is what you were. This is what you did. This is what you lived for. But that ain't us. I don't think God says ain't, but... That's not how we operate. That's not how we live. That's not how we walk. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And he says, look, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. In other words, don't operate in the the same way you used to live. I used to live... 1317 Waverly Avenue, Farmingville, New York. That was my own residence. That's where I grew up. Don't go there and visit me because if you knock on the door, people are going to look at you funny because I don't live there anymore. We haven't been, I haven't lived there for 26 years. But I grew up at 1317 Waverly Avenue, Farmingville, New York. Now, if somebody's listening on TV and that's their address, wouldn't that totally freak them out? <laughs> like, don't you hope? Don't you just hope that maybe they're just like flipping through the channels and they're like, did this guy just say my address, right? Well, that's where I used to live. 
And see, when I grew up, it was totally appropriate for me to get up in the morning and walk downstairs and open the refrigerator, get something up, plop on the couch, watch TV, do whatever I wanted to do because that was my house. That's where I lived. That was what was appropriate in that season of my life. But here's the deal. I don't live there anymore. Could you imagine? <laughs> After service, if I jumped on the expressway, and I headed down to Exit 62, made a right down Waverly Avenue, and I headed down to my old residence. And I just opened the door and walked right in and opened the refrigerator and grabbed something to drink and something to eat and walked into the den and dropped on the couch and put on the football game and popped my feet up. And Wouldn't that be wrong? That would be illegal. I'd end up in jail most likely, and rightly so. You see, one, what was appropriate at one time of my life is no longer appropriate because I'm not at that residence anymore. I don't live there anymore. I'm not that same person anymore. And so now if I try and do what I used to do all the time, what was right at one time is completely wrong. You see where I'm going with this? You see, now as a new creation, the things that were completely okay at one time in my life, that when I lived for myself, when I put myself first, when I worried about the things that would pertain to me, that was consistent with my old nature, but I don't live there anymore. And so now when I do that, the Holy Spirit stops me and says, whoa, 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 whoa. you don't live there anymore. Hey, Tom, it's not about you anymore. We've changed your residence. Put off the old man, right? Which belongs to the former manner of life. And so when I'm living for myself, when I'm doing things that are inconsistent with my new nature, I'm stepping back into a residence that I no longer belong in. And it's corrupt through deceitful desires. But Paul says, but be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Instead, put on the new self. Live at the right address. This new residence, secured by the blood of Jesus Christ, paid in full, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and, and holiness. This idea of walking in the spirit running with the horses no longer looks like I'm at the center of my existence. And Paul lays this out for us in, 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 this, in this letter to the church at Ephesus. Let's, look, let's, let's continue here. Look at verse 15. He says in of chapter five, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, every time you see therefore, you want to find out what it's there for, right? The days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I love that. Do you know God wants you to know what his will is? Your father's not in heaven playing head games with you. <laughs> I think I'd love to see him try and figure this out. No. Your father loves you. Your, his plans and purposes are clear for you. He wants you to know his will. He wants you to know his plans and purposes for your life. The problem is oftentimes we get confused as to what the will of the Lord is is because we are operating in foolishness. And we are operating in ways that have our best interest in mind and not the kingdom's best interest in mind. Therefore, he's like, hey, the days are evil. Don't be like them. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, in the midst of evil days, God has a plan. God has a will. God has a purpose. He's not up there trying to figure out what he's going to do, but he's going to use all of the chaos and the confusion and the craziness of our world to bring about his plans and purposes. And we need to make sure that we're informed by the Spirit of God and not by our own understanding. 
Amen? Understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to what one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul continues to build on this theme that we've been unpacking these last two weeks in particular. We jumped briefly into it, a part of it last week as we looked at verse 18 where Paul talks about the importance of, of being filled with the Spirit. What I want to focus on this morning is the full context of that entire section. The portion of scripture when we read, when, we, when, we, when read in proper context, is not just about being filled with the Spirit, which is super important. That's why I spent a week on that last week and just really raising our awareness to the fact that we need to empty ourselves of ourselves so the Spirit of God might take up residence and flow in us and through us. It's super important. But how the filling of the Spirit is to be lived out as we live our lives is how we'll discover what it means to run with the horses. Too often times we think that, that being full of the Spirit means that we are so disconnected from the world around us and all of the realities and like this, this very esoteric spiritual disconnect. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not what being filled with the Spirit means. It's, it's having the life of God being lived out in you in such a way that you are running with the horses. Let's take a look at how this walk runs with the horses. We don't have to look too far. I think Paul does a really good job at laying out for us a couple of things for us to consider. Number one, how do we run with the horses? Number one, he says, look, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Interestingly, right in the middle of, the, right in the, in the midst of being filled with the Spirit, he also gives us the, the important instruction to look carefully then how you walk. Look carefully means to examine yourself. To consider your ways. To be intentional about the way in which you live your life. Because that's how wise people live. Life was never intended to be just a reflex where we just respond to the loudest and biggest thing that it chooses to insert itself into our existence. Too many times we, we react to the world around us and, and we miss what God is wanting to do in us and through us. So many times we, we approach life like a shotgun approach where we just kind of cover as many different things that we possibly can and we get a lot of good things done but we don't get a lot of great things done. It's living on purpose, not by accident. We consider how our actions will affect our outcomes. Don't you wish you can put that in motion every time? I mean, isn't hindsight wonderful? How many times have you found yourself saying, oh, if I would have known that that was gonna do that, I would not have done that, right? But you see, a life that is lived on purpose, a person who looks carefully than how we walk, considers those things before they do it. And so how do we do that, ready? We slow down. We don't act out before we've gone before the Lord and considered the decisions that we're about to make. We consider how our actions will affect our outcomes. I mean, just think about the disasters that we could have avoided in our lives if we would have just put that in motion. Think about how much more effective we could be if we would just live on purpose. 
with intention. Think about how many more goals we could have accomplished if we weren't getting pulled from all of the things in our life and we had that focus. Look carefully then how you walk. The psalmist says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk according to the counsel of the ungodly or stand or sit in the path of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. We don't want to walk according to the counsel of the world. We want to look carefully at how we walk. That is spirit-filled living. That's allowing the influence of the Holy Spirit to guide our steps before we just move out and think, oh, it just makes sense, let's just do it. Let's just throw it up against the wall and see if it sticks. Look carefully how you walk. Secondly, Paul says, make best use of your time because the days are evil. The walk that runs doesn't waste time. It stewards time. Make the best use of your time because the days are evil. Listen, time is God's gift to you. What you do with that time is your gift back to God. God gives each person a, the gift of time, and not everybody has the same amount of time, right? But we all have the same expectation. We need to steward our time. Have you discovered that everybody wants a little bit of your time? Can I just tell you? It's your time. God's given it to you. Nobody has a right to take it. Nobody has a right to steal it. Nobody has a right to tell you how you need to fill that space of time. God gives it to you and says, steward it. Time is not your enemy. The clock is not your enemy. The calendar is not your enemy. Your schedule is not your enemy. Those are the things that every one of us have got to figure out and learn how to navigate through life in such a way that we take control of our time instead of time taking control of us. Now, I know that, Lance, because we live in a place where we know what it is to run 150 miles an hour on ice all the time, and we need to slow down so that we might hear what God the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Make the best use of your time because we want to live on purpose. I've been alongside a lot of people those last moments of their life and never did I hear somebody say, I wish I would have worked more. I've never heard anybody complain about the fact that they spend too much time with their family. I never heard anybody complain that they spend too much time working in the kingdom of God, spending too much time with God. Never heard anybody ever complain about that. Instead, it's more like, I wish I would have known how short life is. I wish I would have known that I didn't need to work so hard just to try and find significance. I wish I wouldn't have sacrificed the best on the altar of the good as I strove to have more things and more money and more influence and here I am at the end of my life and I look back and it doesn't matter. It's what I hear them say. Time is God's gift to you. What we do with it is our gift back to God. And nobody has the right to take your time. You might give it away, but that's on you. Make the best use. Now, some of us can just go home on that. Make the best use of your time. Number three, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery. 
Now, th while this certainly is referring to, to, to wine, this has to do with more than the, just the consumption of alcohol. This extends to anything that would take control of our life, anything that would influence our life, anything that would change the way in which we are to live our lives. This applies to alcohol, this applies to drugs, this applies to overeating, this applies to unhealthy relationships. Anything that would fuel your flesh. Paul says, don't come under the influence of these things. Because here's the thing, what, what influences you is your, becomes your idol. What takes your time, what controls how you feel, what controls your emotions is an idol. And too many times we've allowed our work, our, our, our resources, other relationships, we've allowed, right, when those are going good, we're good. When those aren't going good, you better stay away from me because I'm not the happiest camper, right? We need to make sure we, we are not allowing those things to influence our lives. That's not God's plan for you and for me. But instead, we are not to get drunk with wine, but... We are supposed to be influenced by someone. We are, we are supposed to, to, to surrender control to somebody. We're not to take control ourselves. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That's what influences us. That's what drives us. That's what informs us. That's what directs our paths. That's what governs our, our priorities. Be filled with the Spirit. That word be is a verb in the Greek. It means be being filled. It's not a one and done experience. It's an ongoing, intentional emptying of ourselves of the things that fuel our flesh and filling ourselves with the things that fuel our spirit. What fuels your spirit? Fellowship, worship, connecting with one another, prayer, time in the word, enjoying one another the way God calls us to enjoy one another. These are the things that, that, that fuel our spirit. Be filled with the spirit. This is the way in which we are to relate with the Holy Spirit. Our relationship with the Holy Spirit is to be one that is a posture of surrender. We relinquish control by surrendering ourselves fully to him. Now that's not gonna be possible if we don't give the Holy Spirit time in our day to influence us. If we're just carving out a couple hours on a Sunday morning, I'll just tell you something, the Holy Spirit's not gonna compete with your job. He's not gonna compete with your hobby. He's not gonna compete with your relationships. There needs to be an ongoing relationship that we have with God that we are consistently going before God to empty ourselves of ourselves so we might be filled with him. It's a posture of surrender. Why are we constantly having to surrender? Because we constantly try to assume control, don't we? We, we've lived our lives a certain way for a really long time. And while our, our, our position before God instantaneously changes, our, our disposition before God instantly changes, sanctification is an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and it takes a lifetime of unlearning those ways. That address can no longer influence my location any longer. Be filled with the Spirit. Number five, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is how we are to relate with one another. With one another. It's, it's not that we're supposed to be singing to one another. Please don't ever come up to me if you're running to me at the grocery store and start singing to me. Right? Don't, don't, that's not what this is about. This isn't about like just, you know, singing to one another. That's weird. 
Don't, don't, please don't ever do that, right? And don't be wearing an Integrity Church shirt if you're doing that, right? That's not a call to be singing to one another, but it's recognizing that as a people of God, the way in which we relate with one another is to be a spiritual act and not a carnal one. Recognizing that you and I have been born again by the Spirit of God, washed in the blood of Christ. We, we have the church of Jesus Christ. We don't have everything in common, but we got the most important things in common. We have one Father. We've been washed in one blood. We have one purpose. And when the people of God are able to get together and connect with one another and journey together in this course of life, it's how we build one another up. We're encouraging each other. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, well, where do they come from? They come from the word of God. And in short, the way in which we see each other needs to be filtered through the lens of what God says we are to one another. This highlights the dignity of all people. If there's any place that there needs to be an appreciation for the diversity that God has created in the world that ought to exist in the church. We ought not to be dividing over race, dividing over sex, dividing over who's special need and not special need, dividing over ethnicity, dividing over socioeconomic status. We ought not to be seeing each other as black and white or, or rich or poor. Or, or That's not the way but instead we are to see each other through the lens of who God has created us to be. I heard somebody say, well, we just, I just wish we'd be colorblind. That's just not happening. And that's not something God wants to happen. That's not the design of God, that we be colorblind, that we don't recognize that people are different. I mean, as I read Revelation chapter five and chapter seven and chapter 14, and I get a picture of the people at the throne of God, the, each of those times it talks about every nation, every tribe, every tongue, all people. We got this picture of the, 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 the beautiful uh, diversity of, of, our, of our creator as we see black and white and yellow coming before the throne of God and worshiping. And the fact that Revelation highlights the fact that there are differences suggests to me that the goal should not be that we're colorblind, but here's the goal, that we don't divide over it. But we celebrate it. We, we recognize the beauty of God's creatorship. And instead of dividing over different, we celebrate over different. That's what we need to do because different isn't bad, different is good. We, we have a God who is, as, 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 he, he is the ultimate creator. The church should never divide over these things. The church should never put value on a person based on the color of their skin or their look or their affluence, amen. We must push back against what the world is saying the way the church is. The world is saying the church is divided in this area. Every person that walks through the doors of this church ought to feel valued. Every person ought to feel the, 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 the acceptance regardless of the color of their skin, the smell of of their body, the clothes they wear, or the car or bicycle that they drive up in. And until that happens, church, we will never reflect what God designs for the church to look like. Revelation gives us a picture of beautiful diversity. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. May the kingdom that we will celebrate around the throne in one day be realized in our midst. As we gather one nation, every nation, before one God and declare worthy. Worthy is the one who sits on the throne. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You can't address one another like that unless you see one another like that. Integrity Church, we've got room to grow in that area. And we need to be intentional about doing that. All the things that distinguish us from one another on this earth will be absorbed into the reality of who we are and whose we are when we stand before him. Number six, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. I said in the first service, that one there's for me. Sing and make melody in your heart toward the Lord. And that's for the one who can't sing very well. Right, that's for the one that really, I, 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 there's been times where at times I'll flip the switch over here during worship and I'll be singing into the microphone and the poor, the poor guys in the back or girls in the back will come running and thinking, what is that God awful sound that's going through our speakers only to discover that I flipped my microphone on and I am now joining with the worship team where I don't belong. And so I am encouraged to make melody in my heart to the Lord, but I belt it out anyway, my father loves it, so it's all good, right? Certainly this idea of making melody in our heart to the Lord, it has to do with singing to the Lord. The Psalms are, are replete, the scriptures are replete with coming before his, the Lord with singing, coming before the Lord with praise and worship. But it's more than just the singing. It's the picture of, of harmony of flow, of unity, of having melody in our heart. In other words, it's not a whole bunch of instruments that are just chaotically, randomly playing, but it's the picture of harmony. Sing and make melody in your heart. Come into, come, here it is, come into alignment with what God is doing. Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Number seven, be thankful always for everything. Be thankful always for everything. Thankfulness is, a, is one of those themes that we see from Genesis through Revelation. Again, it's recurring all throughout the scriptures. Thankfulness is present when we recognize that we are recipients of more than what we deserve. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that God doesn't give me what I deserve. Fran and I are really thankful that God doesn't give you. Everybody else might be very, might think, how many are thankful that, that God doesn't give you what you deserve? I mean, we ought to be living lives of thanksgiving because here's the thing. God sees what goes on in my heart. God knows that in my mind, God knows those things that still need to come into alignment. And, and, and even in those times, he doesn't wipe me out. He calls me son and he's committed to my sanctification and it just creates in me a posture of humility and just thankfulness because I don't deserve it. Be thankful always. Interesting always and for everything. It's easy to be thankful for things that we like, right? If I came up and I gave you a hundred bucks, you'd be thankful for that, right? If I came and took a hundred bucks, you probably wouldn't be too thankful. See, what Paul says here is that we ought to be thankful in everything, always, not just for the things that we like, not just the things that we're happy about, but we are to be thankful all the time for everything, not just the things we celebrate, but those things that we look and say, really, God? 
Because here's the thing, as a child of God, you are never a victim of circumstances. Nothing ever comes into your life that God goes, whoa, that got by me? I had no idea, sorry about that. God never makes mistakes. The scripture says all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so when God brings something into your life that you would choose not to be there, rejoice anyway, be thankful, find the thing, find the way to celebrate what God God may be doing in your life through that. You say, that doesn't make sense. That's right. It didn't make sense at 1317 Waverly Avenue, but this new creation, this spirit-filled living, looks at adversity, looks at challenges, and says, you know what? I wouldn't want this, but if this is where God has me, I'm gonna become more like Jesus in this area. The Holy Spirit's gonna teach me. He's gonna guide me. He's gonna make me more and more into the image of Christ. Be thankful always for everything. And lastly, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. We don't like to submit to anybody. I mean, right? Submit to one another. I mean, that is like, that so goes against our old ways. I mean, we spent a whole lifetime of not, so we wouldn't have to submit. We want to be the one in charge. We want to be the, you know, large and in charge and be in command. And, but now, submit to one another. That's a pill that's tough to swallow. Here, here, here's, here's what makes it possible. Are you ready? In reverence to Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, in other words, submitting to one another as an act of worship to God. Now, I know I'm painting with a really broad brush here when I talk about submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Am I, you know, well, what if this person is saying to, to submit in this area that is sinful? Well, that's a no-brainer. You don't do that, right? That's for another sermon for a different day. What is it really saying is prefer one another. Put others before yourself. You see, when I lived at this other address, it was all about me. And what was for my benefit and for my good and my advancement, but that's not where I live anymore. In this new nature, this new address, now I am about to put you in front of me. And I need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that. But every time I do it, I do it out of reverence for Christ. That's an act of worship. You see, this is important because it highlights the value of the church. Not the organization, but the organism. The body of Christ. Putting others before ourselves. Our strength comes in our mutual dependence upon one another because God designed us as a body to be mutually dependent upon one another. We thrive when we thrive together. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes that's really difficult. With some people, it's really easy to do. With other people, it takes a lot of EGR. EGR is extra grace required. <laughs> extra grace required. Sometimes it just takes a lot. And it's in those moments that we need, really need to remember, I'm doing this out of reverence for Christ. And when the body is living in harmony with one another, we are more effective for the kingdom of God, which is what sets the stage for us to live on purpose, serving together, living out the missional life that God has designed for us to live in this world that we serve as missionaries to. Spurgeon said that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. We are to live out our mission in our jobs, in our community, in our family, as we're going about our life, but our ultimate goal is to reflect Jesus, the one who is our sender to this world that he's pulled us out from and now called us to go to with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's where we're gonna pick up next week as we continue to run with the horses. Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for how it challenges us. It reminds us and informs us and calls us causes us to depend upon you to do in us what we can't do for ourselves. Thank you for, thank you for the invitation to allow the Holy Spirit to be lived out through our lives. May we be found faithful. May we identify those areas in our lives that hinder us from moving out in the way you'd have us to move out. And may we live lives of surrender and passion for the love of our souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen.